Mike Owens with Inside Fighting here, joined today by Victor Altamirano, who returns to Action UFC Paris. Vic, always a pleasure, my man. How things are you today? It was great. Always great seeing you. Uh, it was great talking to you, Mike. I'm glad we have to got to hang out last time you were here in Austin. Mm -hmm. I hope you like the barbecue. I and did. this time I'm excited to go to your side of the hemisphere and see what it's like over there. Well, it's not quite England, Vic, but it's close enough to say that we're all coming full circle. I came over to your side of the world, and you're now coming over to my side of the world. How are your emotions ahead of your return fight? I'm very excited. You know, I love traveling. I love traveling the globe. Uh, I haven't made it to that part of the world yet, so I'm really excited to see it. And most of all, I'm really excited to travel to go do what I love doing, which is the fighting. I'm excited to be there to enjoy the fans of the UFC in that side of the world, in Paris, and just see what the ambience is like. And as you probably already know, every city that the UFC goes to has its own little culture when it comes to the fans. I got to see Mexico's wonderful and loving, and I'm really excited to see Europe's fans and how they are. I know how they like, they're, they are so passionate when it comes to football, the real football, but I'm excited to see what it's like for the UFC over there. I like what you said there about the real football. Not spoken like an American, but spoken like a true football fan, which I like. Um, Paris, you're fight. You're fighting in Paris. You're not fighting a Frenchman, which which might come as some surprise. Was it any surprise to you when you got the booking through for Paris and there wasn't a Frenchman's name attached to the attached to the fight booking? No, not really. You know, I, I told my managers like, look, I'm ready to fight anywhere, anytime. I'm willing to travel, just wherever it is. Let me know and we'll be ready for it. And so when they told me I was going to go to Paris, I was, again, wanting to go to the Sphere, as you mentioned. But, you know, that didn't happen. And Paris, Paris sounds amazing. So I'm excited to go over there and do what I do. What have you made of your opponent? I, I believe he's 0-1 in his UFC career. What have you made of him so far? And give me a scouting report on your next matchup. So we've been looking at him. He He's very explosive. He's very... um. Athletic, so we're expecting some high, you know, high pace fighting at the be very beginning, at the least. We do know that he does gas out throughout the begin, throughout the middle of the fight, and definitely towards the end. And the cardio is something that we definitely don't have any trouble with. I mean, getting nine takedowns at elevation in Mexico City is is a feat that can be only done with great cardiovascular conditions. Mm -hmm. So, Paris, it's not high elevation. If we can do nine takedowns in Mexico City, we can do even more in Paris. So we are scouting to see the cardiovascular system. We know he's explosive. We know he has some power, but we know he gets tired. And we know that as the fight goes on, the technique does diminish on his behalf. We'll be back to the interview in just a second. But first, the NFL season is back and inside fighting as a touchdown of a deal for you. We've partnered up with DraftKings, an official partner of the NFL, to bring you an offer where new DraftKings customers who bet $5 receive $250 in bonus bets instantly, as well as one month of NFL Plus Premium, just by signing up using our promo code Inside Fighting. Talking about the last fight in Mexico City, I'm so that I'm sure that that wound is still a little bit sore because I think it was a fight that I know that you thought you won and the vast majority of fans thought that you won. What did that the experience of the last fight and the way that that fight played out, specifically the decision, teach you going forward? Oh man, I don't know. I don't know what it taught me. It, I guess it taught me that everybody wants to finish. Of course, everybody wants to finish. Of course, everybody knows, you know, that that's something that it taught me because I know that I need to do it and, and everybody needs to do, do so. But it just taught me of how volatile the judging can be. And as, as good as your performance is, you're not guaranteed a win. And it's something that perhaps should be addressed in farther in the farther of future of the sport, because it does affect a lot of the fighters. It affects their career and affects their paycheck. And that is something that we devote a lot of time to for it to come to someone else's decisions that at times are not well informed of the sport itself. Mm. So, you know, it was, um, it, that's what I learned that it can be very volatile and sometimes very unfair. I know I'm biased because I'm me, but getting nine takedowns when the record in my division is 12, having no significant damage on my behalf, and still losing to a split decision, 
I, you know, it's, it's just hard to comprehend how that can happen and hearing it, not just from me, but from my coaches, my peers, fans, people who both know and don't know about the sport, watching the fight and telling me that it was a robbery. Well, I, I don't know what else to take, what else to say. I just know that I learned that it's volatile. I learned, I learned that it can be that way. Is that one of those experiences, Vic, where you either A, alter your style, so you change how you actually fight to, to swing the judges in your on your side in the future, or is it something where you alter perhaps your mindset and you change actually how you're going to approach the fight from a mentality standpoint, or is it neither? I think it's the first one. I think it's how I, I, I put on the better show. You know, perhaps it was um, maybe I just needed to look more flashy maybe i needed mm. to look more appealing to the fans you know maybe i needed to be more out there uh, something something perhaps you know i have no clue how much it had to do that charles Oliveira was in his corner that could have played any factor if at all mm. um i know that he's been really hyped up and they've been looking forward to seeing him fight especially after manuel Coppe. I don't know how much of a factor that played, but, you know, getting control on the ground for the majority of the fights, getting takedowns, you know, nine, getting no significant damage. I mean, I just don't see how that fight went his way. Mm -hmm. I don't, I was surprised that it was split and I was even more surprised that that split was not in my favor. I have to ask you as well, because the fight card before yours is no chair UFC in the sphere. Uh, as Dana keeps saying, a once in a lifetime show, and obviously a massive celebration of of Mexican culture. Any disappointment? You're not you're not on the Noche UFC cards at all. No, no disappointment. I mean, I just fight. I fight. Mm. I'm here to fight. It doesn't matter when. It doesn't matter where. If um, I know there are other Mexican fighters who are also not in that card, but mm. you know, it, it comes down who's available, who's next on the rankings. There are many other factors that play into putting on a card, like who's not injured, who can make this card, which opponents are available in the lineup, how many people, how many fighters can we get in this card, so forth and so on, you know. And, you know, I don't really take it personally. It's just how it works. I know the promotion side of it can be very stressful, and you just need to make it as convenient as possible for a lot of people at the mm -hmm. same time. So I'm not. I'm not feeling any bad about it. With the exception of the main event, it is a Mexican showcase. It is quite surprising. I will say that the Noche UFC card is headlined by two non-Mexicans, but that's just a conversation for another day. Who out of the Mexican talent on the card are you expecting to impress the most? Mm, I would say Marab. I'm really looking forward to for Marab, even though he's... Even he's, though he's representing not a Mexican. Mexico. Yeah, okay, but he's okay. representing Mexico. But I would say also um, another one of my acolytes, um, also a 25er, I forgot his name. He fought with me in Mexico too. But um, he's been looking really good. And Is that Kevin, Kevin Borges? No, he, he's, um, he's from Mexico. Oh. Man, I forgot his name. I'm sorry. No I'm problem. sorry I forgot your name, but but I'm looking forward to him, especially because he's also a 125er and perhaps we may see him again. Can I ask you as, as a Mexican fighter and someone who's much more ingrained in Mexican MMA fight culture than me, Alexa Grasso as UFC world champion defending her belt against Valentina Shevchenko in a third fight but as a reigning defending Mexican MMA champion. How big do you think that is for the growth of Mexican MMA? I think it's big. I think really any fighter that has made it to that level, to the main card, especially the championships and holding mm. the belt when it comes to Mexico, that's a big deal. And it's not only a big deal when it comes to the representation of the sport, but it's a big deal for the inspiration of the following generation that's going into the sport. I remember the first time I went back to Mexico, the um, the MMA culture, you know, it was active, it was alive. There were several gyms open. And there were great talent already. There are some leagues over there, like Lux, which is some of the leagues that um, some of the Mexican fighters have come from. I think Alexa Grasso may be one of them. Mm, possibly. And it just makes, it just grows. Mostly the most important part is that 
the people who she trained with still live in Mexico. The, the generation that watches her, the people she trains with, the other people that will come up and later on be one of her contemporaries in the UFC. You know, it's, mm-hmm. it's a big deal. It's a big deal because not only is she a Mexican, she's also a woman. And it's, it's a man's sport. And the representation that Shevchenko has given to the sport when it comes to women has been amazing. And now for Mexico to have its own, mm. it's been big. So I'm really looking forward to that. And even more so looking forward to the inspiration that's going to come from that. 100%. Talking about what's next to come, I want to switch the conversation quickly to your division because there is a question around who Alexandre Pantoja will defend his 125 pound belt against next. Who do you think should be next to face Pantoja for the world title? Man, I think Kara France deserves it. Kara France has been going at it. Kara France has been very, you know, committed. He just won his last one. It was really wonderful. Mm. And he's been so close so many times. And if they were willing to, if they were willing to skip San Hagen and give Chido, Chido Vera the belt, uh, a chance to the belt against uh, O'Malley, then give it to Kai. Mm. Give it to Kai. I mean, like I just mentioned, they skipped San Hagen, give it to Cheeto. San Hagen should have had yeah. that opportunity before Cheeto. You know, nothing against him, but he did beat Cheeto. Mm. And now, if that if, if if that's something that the UFC is willing to do, then give it to Kara France. He deserves it, I think. We have just seen, I believe, yesterday, Brandon Moreno booked against Amir Albazi. I think that's number one. Or well, number two, sorry, versus number three in the division. How how do you see that fight playing out? If that, if that man, that's gonna true? be that's gonna be an easy one for Moreno. I mean, Kara France lost to Vasi in a very controversial fight. I may add, you know, uh, back the back to what we're talking about. It can be very volatile, mm. and I believe Kara France won that fight. Yeah. So that's just another one of my reasons why I think Kara France should have a shot at the next belt. And when it comes to Brandon and Albasi. I think Brandon's going to make easy work of him. I mean, he fought he fought um Kara France, Brandon did, and mm. defeated him with a liver kick, but up into that moment it looked a pretty competitive fight. Mm. And if Kara France beat uh, Albasi in my eyes, mm. then Brandon should have no problem with it. I want to turn the conversation back to yourself because as the, as much as we've discussed the controversial and then the last fight and the judging around that you are coming off the back of back-to-back losses. Are you feeling any extra pressure going into this fight and any extra pressure to not only get the win, but also to perform and impress and and really uh, make your mark on this division? I do. I do feel some pressure when it comes to the eyes looking at me, the eyes of the UFC, mm. the eyes of the, of the promoters, the eyes of the matchmakers. Mm. But when it comes to me as an athlete and my coaches and my teammates, there is no pressure. We know we had amazing performances back to back, even the one with Tim Elliott, you know, even though it was a loss. And I do take that loss, you know, it wasn't a loss that caused me uh, injury. It wasn't a loss that really uh, hurt me. It wasn't a loss that caused me a lot of damage. It was just a loss by points, by judges. It was really, you know, the way that a fighter would fight, a veteran fighter like Tim, it's like, Mm-hmm. That's his game plan. That's the dude. Boom. You know, and I was very honored to have stepped in the cage with Tim Elliott, one of my teammates now, which I'm also very honored mm-hmm. to. And when it comes to my last fight, I have no complaints when it comes to my development, when it comes to what I was able to do that fight. Of course, my complaints come from what I think was the unfair decision. But when it comes to what was displayed no pressure there we're just going to do it again show that my partner feels the pressure don't give him a chance to do anything you know big just like we did last fight and hopefully we get a finish and if we don't hopefully the judges will see it and you know it would just be a big bummer if i got robbed twice in a row 100 percent. well last yes. question from me Vic, and thank you so much for your time you can, again, as always, you can be as brief or as detailed as you like, but give me a walkthrough of your perfect fight day. I'd like to know, as you envisage it, what happens when you wake up in the morning to when you go to sleep at night on fight day. So we wake up, we go for a run, we warm up with the body, 
let's show that we are mentally and physically inspired to do so. We show up to the arena and then we step before our opponent. We snipe him from range. We make sure that he gets frustrated, but he feels pain. And as the fight goes on and the cardio goes low, we continue with the pressure. We continue with the strikes. And if he gets close enough, we take him down and we make sure that he gets nothing. I love it. I love it. It's always good catching up, my man. Thank you so much for the time. Very excited to hopefully see you fight live over on my side of the world. Have a great and safe rest of your camp and hopefully see and talk to you soon. Yes, sir. Have a good one, Mike. Thank you.